So it's Trump versus Biden. Now, we've known that for legitimately months, if not years at this point. But with Nikki Haley dropping out of the race this week, the race is now finalized. It is Trump. It is Biden. Part two, Electric Boogaloo. Are you ready for the sequel? Oh, man. Oh, the revenge campaign. Donald Trump, the first Republican candidate since Richard Nixon to actually be nominated three separate times. And of course, the first presidential candidate to think about two non-consecutive terms since Grover Cleveland running against the oldest president in American history, Joe Biden. So if you're excited, let me recommend that it is currently March and there's eight more months of this. We haven't even gotten started yet. And of course, this campaign has been going on for quite a while. Well, Joe Biden is now trotting out a memo. It's been put out by his campaign chair, Jen O'Malley Dillon, and campaign manager, Julie Chavez Rodriguez. And it was issued in full to media outlets. And here is what this memo says. This is a memo that's laying out the Biden strategy against Donald Trump. Subject, Trump enters the general election beleaguered and ill-equipped. The results of last night's Super Tuesday contest cemented what we have known for some time now. Donald Trump limps into the general election as a wounded, dangerous, and unpopular candidate. The Republican nominee is cash-strapped, beleaguered by a host of external issues, and is running on an extreme agenda that is already proving to be a significant liability for key voting blocks that are critical to the pathway to 270 electoral votes. Well, that's some wishful thinking right there, given the fact that Donald Trump is in commanding poll position. He did not lead at pretty much any point in the 2020 race. In fact, in the last few months of polling, Donald Trump led in precisely two polls in the Real Clear Politics polling average. I mean, like, not in the average. Two polls included in that average over the course of the last several months of that election cycle. And then he outperformed the Real Clear Politics polling average by about three percentage points. He tends to outperform his polls in general elections because there are so many people who end up voting Trump who don't want to tell pollsters they're actually going to vote for Trump. Right now, Donald Trump has led this race in the Real Clear Politics polling average since mid-September. Joe Biden has led in the last 30 polls a grand total of four. He is tied into others. Okay. That means, for those counting, that in 24 of the last 30 polls, Donald Trump is in the lead. So when they say that he has significant liabilities, I mean, Donald Trump does have significant liabilities, but he does have one particular asset, and that is that Joe Biden is the other candidate. The memo says, Team Biden-Harris heads into the general election, coming off consistent wins up and down the ballot, maintains a historic and growing grassroots-powered war chest, and now adds a strong Super Tuesday showing last night to enter the general election well-prepared and well-positioned to win this November. Now, notice how much they're relying on the amount of cash they have stacked up in the back room over there. Let me make something very, very clear. The amount of cash you have in a presidential election cycle is no longer determinative of victory. Democrats have routinely outspent Republicans. Donald Trump was outspent by Hillary Clinton widely in 2016. It did not matter. What are you going to do? Change people's opinion of Donald Trump at this point? Everyone knows what they think of Donald Trump at this point. Ain't no late breaking voters in this election cycle. Donald Trump has been the center of the American political universe since 2015. The year is now 2024. So for fully a decade, the entire political universe has revolved around Donald Trump. Joe Biden has been a known quantity since the 1970s. Joe Biden was in the Senate before I was born. There is no one in this race who's sitting around going, man, I just can't, I can't. Who are these guys? I need some introductory ads. Probably if they drop a billion dollars introducing me to Joe Biden, maybe then I'll think like everyone knows what they think of these candidates. But the Biden delusional memo continues. Building off last night's momentum, tomorrow evening's State of the Union address will provide the American people with the latest example of the stark choice they will be confronted with in November between President Biden, who remains laser focused on delivering for the American people while running on a historically popular record of accomplishment. I have some questions. And Donald Trump, whose failed record and dark vision for this country is as dangerous as it is unpopular with the voters who will decide this election. Okay, so um, first of all, you can tell this isn't an internal memo and that it is directed solely at outside consumption because it's just filled with crap. When they say that Joe Biden is laser focused, only in the sense that a cat is focused laser like on, you know, like an actual pinpoint of laser on the wall. Joe Biden is not laser focused on anything except his oatmeal and that only between the time that his oatmeal reaches the bowl and the time that his spoon hits the oatmeal between there and his mouth, things go totally haywire. We'll get to more on this in just one moment. First, let's say you were a duke of an intergalactic house, and one day your emperor decided to give you an additional desert planet to rule. Well, you'd probably think, that sounds like an amazing gift. Wrong you are, because that same emperor decided to blindside you and murder you in your sleep. Pretty sure Duke Leto really wished he had some life insurance the moment that hunter-seeker pierced his body. 
No one likes to talk about life insurance, but it's incredibly important and you need to include it in your financial planning this year. Start shopping now with Policy Genius. Find the right policy to protect your family today. Give yourself the peace of mind that comes with knowing that if something were to happen to you, your family can cover all their expenses while getting back on their feet. Policy Genius's technology makes comparing life insurance quotes from America's top insurers easy. Just a few clicks. You already have a life insurance policy through work, but that might not be enough. And if you move jobs, then it doesn't follow you. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies starting at just 292 bucks per year for a million dollars in coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. When they make it this easy, there really is not an excuse not to do it. Save time, money, provide your family with financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro or click that link in the description. Get your free life insurance quotes. See how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash Shapiro. Meanwhile, when they say that Joe Biden is running on a historically popular record of accomplishment, I would love to see some polling that bears that out. National polling eight months out confirms what we know to be true. This will be a very close general election contest, like all modern presidential elections are, but we have a clear path to victory say the members of Biden's campaign. Beyond Donald Trump's demonstrated an inability to expand his appeal beyond the MAGA base, that is not true, actually, which this memo covers in detail below, upwards of 10% of voters remain undecided, much larger than the current margin between Trump and Biden in polling. So they're now counting on everybody who's counting as undecided to vote in favor of Joe Biden. Good luck with that. I think that that is very large scale wishful thinking. That's a bunch of people who don't want to say they're voting for Trump. I would bet that independents in this election cycle, if the election were held today, would vote for Trump. They would break for Trump. Those voters are highly supportive of the policies of the Biden-Harris administration, like protecting abortion access, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, and defending the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, because there are so many people right now I've talked to, and you've talked to, so many voters who are deeply worried about Obamacare at this point. These undecided voters are also the least tuned in to politics of any group. Heading into Super Tuesday, 31% of all voters said they are not even certain Trump will be the Republican nominee. So they are counting on the ignorant voters to carry them through. Well, again, I don't think that's going to work. So they say, here are the key questions that everyone should be asking. Quote, which candidate is consolidating their coalition? The answer there is actually Donald Trump, not Joe Biden. Joe Biden's got real coalitional problems. The moderates in his coalition do not like the radicals. The radicals do not like the moderates. Which candidate is amassing the resources and building the infrastructure necessary to run a modern campaign that reaches the voters who will decide this election? This is where Democrats really do have an advantage. The RNC has done a piss poor job of trying to arrange resource allocation, raising money and spending it in order to actually get people out to vote on the day of the election, going and picking up ballots in places where ballot harvesting is legal. Democrats do have an advantage there, and Republicans do need to pour money into that, not into Trump's legal issues. They need to be pouring money into all of the the get-out-the-vote efforts that Democrats are pouring money into. Most importantly, which candidate has a winning agenda and a winning track record at the ballot box? For each and every one of these questions, they say the answer is the same, Joe Biden. Joe Biden is the only candidate in history who has beaten Donald Trump, and he will do so again. Well, I mean, pretty small sample size. I mean, like he ran once and he won once. I wouldn't call that quite dispositive. And then they say that Joe Biden is consolidating his coalition because he has strong support in diverse states with black, Latino, white working class and suburban voters. Mm-mm. He's under polling with all of them. And then they look at the actual primary states and say that he's doing like an amazing job. And pri- he's running unopposed. Donald Trump's primary performances, says the Biden campaign, are a major warning sign for the GOP and an opportunity for President Biden to expand his coalition. Trump heads into the general election, unable to expand his support beyond the hardcore MAGA base, and they just are citing Nikki Haley. Well, the problem is a huge percentage of Nikki Haley voters were Democrats who crossed over to vote in open primaries. So again, this is a lot of wishful thinking on the part of Team Biden. They say that as voters tune into the election, Biden can expand his coalition and consolidate his support. Today's media consumption is more fragmented and personalized than ever. For most Americans, the November election has not yet become a daily topic at the kitchen table. Uh, I don't think that that's true either. Because again, the candidates are all known quantities. We know all of them. And everybody who is not in the Biden campaign knows this. Steve Kornacki, the pollster extraordinaire, his poll analysis on MSNBC is actually quite good at his job, Steve Kornacki. He points out, That actually, if you're talking about who is coalescing the base, it is not Joe Biden, it is Donald Trump. In the context of what we're seeing in the general election, the one who has the issue right now with the base is more Biden than Trump. Because this is from the New York Times poll. They asked folks, hey, you voted for Trump in 2020. Are you still with Donald Trump? 97% of his 2020 voters say they're still with him. Ask Biden's 2020 voters, are you still with Biden? The number is 85% there. So at least right now in the general election polling, 
It's Trump who's taking more from Biden's voters than Biden who's taking from Trump's voters. Not just that. In the primaries, people who are voting for Trump say they are excited not just to vote against Biden. They are excited to vote for Trump. Joe Biden's voters, no one is excited to vote for Joe Biden. They're only excited to vote against Donald Trump. That's kind of a problem for him. Speaking of coalescing the base, even people who are considered anti-Trump Republicans, people like Mitch McConnell, the outgoing Senate minority leader, Mitch McConnell endorsed Trump today. Mr. Leader, you know, you know, you know, how do you reconcile your Trump endorsement with the fact that you called him practically and morally responsible for January 6th and, and the fact that he insulted you and your wife repeatedly? Well, February the 25th, 2021, shortly after the attack on the Capitol, I was asked a similar question. And I said I would support the nominee for president even if it were the former president. Mr. McConnell, in April of last year, you indicated and didn't really directly answer the question as to whether or not you were comfortable with Mr. Trump if he was in the middle of criminal trials and indictments, he was the nominee. I presume that means you're comfortable with him. I, I don't have anything to add to what I just said. I said in February of 2021, shortly after the attack on the Capitol, that I would support President Trump if he were the nominee of our party, and he obviously is going to be the nominee of our party. Okay, that is Mitch McConnell saying the obvious. If you get Mitch McConnell behind you and you're the Republican Party, you ain't going to have a problem turning out the base. You're not going to have a problem with the coalescing of the Republican Party. The same is not true for Democrats. And as for those moderate voters, Joe Biden is the one who has been alienating them by moving toward people like Bernie Sanders. Bernie keeps threatening Joe Biden from his left. According to the Washington Post, in a meeting in the Oval Office last fall with Biden and senior White House aides, Bernie Sanders quoted from a speech delivered by FDR in one of the most successful Democratic presidential re-election campaigns of the last 100 years. Pointing to a portrait of Roosevelt that hangs above the Oval Office's fireplace, Sanders cited Roosevelt's 1936 remarks at Madison Square, Madison Square Garden, emphasizing the extent of elite business opposition to the New Deal. And then he suggested that Joe Biden needs to run as FDR that he has to affirm the public's frustration over the economy and focus on identifying the political opposition to enacting the president's agenda like big business and big pharma. Again, if Joe Biden is relying on electoral victory for adv advice from Bernie Sanders, good luck to you, sir. Now, of course, the biggest problem for Joe Biden is that he is personally a deeply unattractive candidate. Not only do most people think that he is not sympathetic and that he is manipulative, which is a big difference from 2020. In 2020, he was sort of the benevolent old fellow who didn't really know what he was doing. It's kind of a fuddy-duddy, but at heart, a, a nice guy. And now he has been exposed as somebody who is willing to do pretty much anything for political gain, label his political opposition enemies of the state. He's somebody who will go to funerals for other people's children and then claim that his son died in Iraq. He, and, and he'll use that as an excuse for pretty much everything. He, he's somebody who has engaged in corruption for decades with members of his own family. And more than anything else, the man is just not with us. That is a that is a major problem. It is a major problem. Donald Trump is old, but Donald Trump is still energetic. Joe Biden is old and Joe Biden is not alive anymore. And this is going to be a continuing problem. And so basically, Democrats have two choices, both of them unpalatable with regard to Joe Biden. Choice number one is to just whistle past the literal graveyard at this point, pretend everything is fine. That is choice being taken by Joe Scarborough. Get to more on this in just one second. First, it is no secret that our healthcare system is a subject of considerable debate. And if you've watched the news, you know that U.S. pharmacies are not only running out of basic antibiotics, but the current wait time to see a doctor could be up to a month. Well, I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than somebody in my family getting sick while a supply chain problem or doctor's wait list kept them from getting the medication they need. Thankfully, my family has a medical emergency kit from the wellness company. This kit can treat over 39 different medical issues with prescriptions like ivermectin, generic ZPAC, and amoxicillin. The medical emergency kit gives you peace of mind in unforeseen medical emergencies and resource shortages. Every kit includes a medical emergency guidebook as an educational resource for safe use. Don't wait until it's too late. Get your medical emergency kit from the wellness company today. Visit twc.health slash Ben. Enter promo code Ben for a 15% discount. The process only takes about three minutes online. It could not be simpler. Your home medical emergency kit ships directly to your door. Don't wait. Visit twc.health slash Ben. Enter promo code Ben for your discount. So Joe Scarborough yesterday in full Baghdad Bob mode talking about how actually, actually, Joe Biden is he's in tip top shape. He's incredible. That, that dude is doing hand springs back at the White House. You should see him. I mean, it's inc like he can he can do an iron cross. You see him on the rings. It's unreal, Joe Biden. Here we go. 
But comparing that guy's mental state, I've said it for years now. He's cogent. Mm -hmm. But I undersold him when I said he was cogent. He's far beyond cogent. Wow. In fact, I think he's better than he's ever been. Ever. Intellectually. Wow. Um, analytically. Because he's been around for 50 years. And, you know, I don't know if people know this or not. Biden used to be a hothead. <laughs> Sometimes that Irishman would get in front of the reasoning. Sometimes he would say things he didn't want to say. This is... And, and, and I don't really, you know what, I don't really care. Start your tape right now, because I'm about to tell you the truth. And F you if you can't handle the truth. This version of Biden, intellectually, analytically, is the best Biden ever. Not a close second. And I've known him for years. The Brzezinski's have known him for 50 years. If it weren't the truth, I wouldn't say it. You might say it because it's not true. If this is the best version of Joe Biden, what does the worst version of Joe Biden look like exactly? I mean, the guy can't even say full sentences anymore. He walks into walls. He has no idea where he is half the time. Also, side note, Joe Scarborough increasingly looks like where's Waldo. But that's a side point. Or you could be Joy Reid. The, so the, the memo has gone out. MSNBC is just going to say the thing. They're going to say the reason that Joe Biden looks old and is old is not because he's old. It's because he's actually unbelievable at the job. That Joe Scarborough clip is, is pretty insane. Joy Reid tries to match him point for point here. She says the reason that Joe Biden looks old is because he's working so darn hard. It's because he's it's not because he's 81 years old, which is kind of old. It's because he's working so hard at being president, so hard that he calls a lid at 1130 every morning and then proceeds to wander around the White House in his bathrobe trying to grab his dog's tail because, look, a doggy. And then he falls over occasionally. And then they bring him his dinner from Denny's. And then they shovel him off to bed. And in the morning, the night nurse comes in. She cleans up the bed. She redoes the covers. They stick him full of something. He goes out there. He goes, anyway. And then a lid. So here, here's Joy. The, the real reason he looks old, guys, is because he's just, he's efforting so hard. So much effort. Donald Trump had one job. He had one crisis. He's saying, oh, all of these things were perfect. You had one crisis, bruh. It was called the pandemic. And you know what you did? You bollocksed it completely. You did so poorly at managing your sole crisis. The one hard thing you do, the reason he doesn't look old like Biden looks older, <laughs> the presidency <laughs> ages you when you do the job. Obama went gray because he was doing the work. Donald Trump looks the same as when he ran because he was playing golf the whole time. Oh, that's what happened. That's what happened. I mean, also, Barack Obama was in the White House for eight years and was much younger when he started. So, I mean, people sort of age incrementally. As they get older, they hit a certain age and then they sort of look kind of the same because they're kind of old. Yeah, that, that's just the way that it is. But like, it's because Joe Biden's working hard that he's old. That's weird. Because I know a bunch of people who are exactly Joe Biden's age and are way more with it than Joe Biden. One of the beauties of going to my synagogue is that there's a lot of intergenerational contact, like people who are my age go out to lunch with people who are 80. And I got to tell you, I know a dozen people who are 81 years old who are way more with it than Joe Biden is at this point. So that is strategy number one for the Democrats is pretend actually everything is fine. The other strategy is the Hillary Clinton strategy. And I know this is the first time I'm ever going to say this points for honesty to Hillary Clinton. She says, yeah, he's old, but, you know, you got to go with him. This, by the way, is the proper Democratic argument. It's the same argument they made about John Fetterman. The basic argument is this. Sure, the brain don't work good, but, you know, the alternative is worse. That's actually Democrats best argument here, because they certainly cannot keep talking about how Joe Biden is super with it. Somebody the other day uh, said to me, Zerlina, well, but, you know, uh, Joe Biden's old. I said, you know what? Joe Biden is old. Let's let's <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, accept the reality. Joe Biden is old. So really, Pick between your two old ones uh, and figure out how you're going to save our democracy. OK, so that at least is an angle. But Joe Biden won't take that angle because, again, Joe Biden, the thing about Joe Biden is he actually still thinks he's a spring chicken. You know, literally last week, he suggested that he is with Jill Biden and they have a great marriage because of the sex. And every single person in human contact began to vomit. It was an amazing, I mean, he has that effect on people, but that, I mean, we didn't need to hear about Joe's sex life. By the way, I don't believe him. That, that prostate gave out long ago. In any case, 
Donald Trump is obviously going to challenge Joe Biden on this front. And so today he came out and he said that he wants a primary debate with Joe Biden. He tweeted, quote, it is important for the good of our country that Joe Biden and I debate issues that are so vital to America and the American people. Therefore, I'm calling for debates anytime, anywhere, any place. The debates can be run by the corrupt DNC or their subsidiary, the Commission on Presidential Debates. I look forward to receiving a response. Thanks for your attention to this matter. So the, the, the fact that, that Donald Trump is like, I don't care, anytime, any place, anyone, doesn't matter. You know, we, in front of a doghouse, in front of the Four Seasons Gardening and Lawn Club, don't care, anywhere. That's because Donald Trump is working under the correct assumption that even a mild juxtaposition between him saying sentences and Joe Biden saying sentences will not end well for Joe Biden. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, not only do blinds enhance the aesthetic appeal of your home, they also offer practical benefits. By effectively blocking out harmful UV rays, they help protect your furniture and flooring from fading, ensuring your interiors retain their beauty for years to come. Their insulating properties help regulate the temperature inside your home, keeping it comfortable year-round while potentially reducing your energy bills. With over 40,000 five-star reviews, Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. You can measure and install them yourself or have Blinds.com send local professionals to take care of the installation for you. There's no showroom, no retail markets, no no matter how many, or installation is just one low cost. And if you don't have an eye for design, Blinds.com experts are always available to help choose the style and color right for you. Everything they sell is covered by their perfect fit and 100% satisfaction guarantee. With hundreds of styles and colors to choose from, Blinds.com is sure to have the perfect treatments for your windows. Shop Blinds.com's anniversary sale right now through March 13th for up to 50% off. Again, save up to 50% off for a limited time at Blinds.com. And when you check out, don't forget to tell them you heard about them at The Ben Shapiro Show. Rules and restrictions may apply. You know who's working on the, under the same supposition? The Biden campaign. Here's Corinne Jean-Pierre asked specifically about whether Joe Biden would debate Donald Trump. Now, of course, it's not going to happen. There's no way in hell. And frankly, I'm kind of surprised that she doesn't just say that. That she doesn't just say in, it is the position of this campaign that Donald Trump is an insurrectionist and we don't debate insurrectionists or we don't debate people who have actually had civil judgments against them for rape. Or like there, there are a thousand lines she could use and instead they're just going to keep pretending that they don't know the answer to this when everyone knows the answer to it. Is President Biden going to commit to a debate with Donald Trump? That's something for uh, the campaign to speak to. Well, we know when the debates are going to be. We oh, know where they're going to be. Is he going to go? You should speak to the campaign. In 2020, once it got down to one-on-one, -on -one, Joe Biden said, I can hardly wait to debate him. How about now? I'm going to sound like a broken record. You should reach out to the campaign. OK, that is not just a campaign question. That's a question of presidential scheduling. They're not asking about Donald Trump's political chances. They're asking whether Joe Biden will show up to a debate, which is a presidential question as well as a campaign question. And then Karine Jean-Pierre has asked, you know, the president has note cards for pretty much everything. Like you may notice this. Every so often they'll catch him on screen and he'll be holding a note card and there will be a zoom into the note card and it will say, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in breathe out because Joe Biden has to be informed on every basic matter in his life. So a reporter asks her, she's like, are you getting on his case because he uses note cards? Well, yeah, because he does it for like every single human thing, every human activity. Now, listen, I know about being cute, right? My schedule is a mess. I have an assistant, Kelly, who basically makes sure that I take out the garbage. That's not quite the same thing as if I went on the show every single day with a set of note cards. And then I was like, oh, and and you oh. Oh, no, I know. Yeah. Here we go. Why does the president rely so heavily on note cards? You're upset because the president has note cards? Yes. You're, you're asking me a question about the president having note cards? Yes. I'm asking why. The does president he rely who so has heavily? had a probably one of the most successful first three years of, of an administration than any modern day president. That's your response? You? How dare you ask about the fact that the president of the United States is senile? Are you saying that this man, this magnificent human specimen, that this virile man, that this example of human powerhouse qualities, this man, you're saying? Yeah, yeah that's what we're asking. We're asking about the note cards. Yes. <laughs> I love people, the, the righteous indignation about basic, basic questions like why does the president read off note cards and why can't he read? Those ones are pretty easy. So. All of this stacks up for it's going to be a fascinating State of the Union tonight. Who's ready for a State of the Union? So here is my obligatory 
30 second rip on the State of the Union. I hate the State of the Union. It's monarchic crap. There's no reason that the legislature, which is a co-equal and in fact, under the Constitution, predominant branch in American government in terms of legislation, should kowtow to the president where no matter who the president is, he walks in and everybody grips and grins and does a picture with him and they all do weird smiles and then they stand up and they clap and then they sit down as though we're at some sort of strange rock concert where half of the concert is populated by a cult worshiping the rock star and the other half of the concert just hates them, hates them. And like, it, it's so stupid. The whole thing is dumb. And then everybody has their guests up in the balcony and we pretend that we care who the guests are. Oh, look, the president is calling on Rando McJones over there. Uh, Rando, Rando, stand up and, and explain how I, Rando's a, a good plumber. He's a, he's a hell of a plumber, Rando. Rando, take a round. Uh. And we do that for like eight hours. Okay, but with that out of the way, I will say that I'm looking forward to the State of the Union. Why, you may ask? Because it's going to be amusing. It's going to be amusing. He's going to say a bunch of dumb stuff. He's going to say a bunch of dumb stuff about politics. It's not going to make any sense. He's going to give you a giant list of things that he wants to do. If we stick together and we try really, really hard, we can cure cancer with a moonshot. He's used that in every single State of the Union address of his presidency and every speech before that. And then you're going to get him talking about all oh, the corporations, all oh, the corporations, and, uh, you know, you don't get you know, fewer chips in your bag of chips. And let me tell you, I, when I open that Lay's potato chips, I want every chip in there. Not seven chips, nine chips. We'll get some of that. We'll get some of the, I have presided over the most job creation in American history. If you don't count the part where, you know, we had a giant band. Uh, 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 and inflation is good. It's going to be a lot of that. But what are we all watching for? We're watching to see whether he lives. So this is high, <laughs> this high stakes stuff, guys, because basically we are watching the political version of Saw. He's down in the basement. He's chained down there. It's going to end real poorly. I don't know quite how it's going to end real poorly. Is he going to escape? Is he going to gnaw off his own political leg? What's it going to be? What happens if the teleprompter goes on the fritz? Ooh, you want to end his presidency? All you need is one guy going after that plug and that's it. You pull the plug on the teleprompter, you pull the plug on Joe Biden. Can you imagine Joe Biden trying to riff for more than 27 seconds? Woo! So that's going to be the amusing part. And so we are all going to be watching this on tenterhooks. I mean, it's the same feeling you have when you watch Joe Biden go up the stairs. Now, listen, as a parent of four young children, 10, 7, 4, and 9 months, let me tell you, I spend virtually all of my day when I'm not on the air with the kids. And that means that I spend an enormous amount of time trying to foresee obstacles to their to their physical health. And because kids are little suicide machines, all they do is run into things. If there's anything in a remote area that can harm them, they will be there in a second. They're like mag they're magnetically drawn to things that can harm them. So I can spot threats like a mile off. Like if my kid is on a tall chair and the kid starts like even remotely rocking that chair, the kid's off the chair, right? Because you know, you know that like Chekhov's gun, it will be like the chair will topple. Somebody will get hurt. You spend your entire life guarding against that. That's like watching a Joe Biden speech now. I'm watching the Joe Biden speech and I can see it coming. I can see it coming like a train down the tracks, bearing down on old Joe. And that train is physical reality. Will he have like a full on two minute just gaff? Or he just starts speaking in tongues? Is he going to go out there and start talking about his favorite episode of Mr. Rogers? No one knows. Is he going to get up there and start jabbering about his sex life with Jill? Could happen. And frankly, I'm here for it. It's the, this is the most suspenseful State of the Union address of my lifetime, by far. And um, kind of looking forward to, be, to it, to be honest with you. Good news is that you can watch it with us tonight, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. You can watch it. We're going to be doing our backstage live. And again, I, I will say there, there is only one way, I think, that Joe Biden can, can actually make the speech a success. And no, it's not to take enormous amount of Hunter's cocaine. I think the only way that he can actually make this a success is that at some point he's going to have to reach into his actual podium and then he's going to have to say, and I have something here for you, something that I think will change your day. Cervezas Cristal! That's the, that's the only way that this is going to be good. But I'm really, I am. I, I'll be honest, you know, I don't get my entertainment from politics. I take it too seriously. But if you can't see this for the comedy routine that it most definitely is, I pity you. I pity the fool who can't see how ridiculous this is going to be. We'll get to more on this in just one moment. First, we all know the first thing we do when we get home from work is change out of those work clothes and 
jump into loungewear. Well, luckily for me, I have Tommy John to come home to as I slip into my Tommy John loungewear set. I'm immediately enveloped in a cocoon of supreme softness and unparalleled comfort. Not only is their loungewear cozy enough to use as sleepwear, well, if I have to walk to the park with my kids, I don't look like a schlub. And guys, you might be wondering how these things can get any better. Their underwear is the best. I've been talking about this for years. If you haven't tried them, you're missing out. I took all the other underwear I had. I threw them out. I only wear Tommy John's. Tommy John's stylish and soft second skin underwear has dozens of comfort innovations, like a supportable contour pouch, a breathable light wick, moisture wicking fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands. Plus, Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or its free guarantee protects your most valuable assets. So what exactly are you waiting for? Try Tommy John today. You can thank me later. For silky soft comfort with sophisticated style, check out Tommy John's luxurious second skin limited edition colors right now at tommyjohn.com slash Ben. They're going fast, so hurry to tommyjohn.com slash Ben. Okay, meanwhile, speaking of ridiculous people getting hit in the face by reality, Kathy Hochul is the governor of New York. Remember that time that the New York Times went absolutely insane? The entire staff, they went absolutely insane because the New York Times in the middle of gigantic, historic, large riots in the middle of 2020, the most damaging riots in terms of property damage in American history, $2 billion in property damage. You remember that Tom Cotton, the senator from Arkansas, he had the temerity to suggest that perhaps the National Guard should be called out to, you know, arrest people who are burning things down. And everyone at the New York Times went nuts. It was insane. No, no, you, people will get killed. We were told by people like Nicole Hannah-Jones, that brilliant mind. I'm being incredibly sarcastic right now. Nicole Hannah-Jones is a dullard. Nicole Hannah-Jones, the historical falsifier. She, she's like, everybody in the New York Times, in the op-ed page, in the news page, they're like, this op-ed will get people killed. People will die because you suggested that the National Guard be called on rioters. That is unacceptable. And James Bennett, who is the op-ed editor, he had to resign over it for the great sin of publishing the most commonsensical op-ed, perhaps the New York Times, has ever published. I love, I still love that the New York Times will print op-eds from like genocidal heads of Iran, from actual terrorists working for Hamas. Tom Cotton writes an op-ed like, hey, you know, guys, maybe like if the cops can't handle it, we should call the National Guard. And everybody at the New York Times is like, no, no. Impo-. Well, now the chickens are coming home to roost, ain't they? Because Kathy Hochul, the far left governor of New York, she has now announced that she is going to deploy 750 members of the National Guard and 250 state and MTA police officers to the subways, to the subways. This is how bad things have got at the New York subways. So it turns out that broken windows policing, which is if you have somebody jumping a turnstile, you arrest them and then you put them in jail for a prolonged period of time. And then people won't commit bigger crimes. Broken windows theory, which was first promulgated by James Q. Wilson, the sociologist, his basic theory is that If you have a neighborhood and a window is broken and not fixed and the person who breaks the window is not arrested, soon there will be lots of broken windows and then there will be property damage and then there will be violent crime. That, of course, is right. New York, because it decided on no cash bail, just catch and release for criminals, essentially, because they decided they weren't even going to police at all so-called minor crimes like jumping turnstiles. Well, sooner or later, what you end up with is people getting pushed on the tracks in New York City. And so now Kathy Hochul has been forced to deploy the National Guard to the subway system of the biggest city in America, plus 250 state and MTA police officers to check bags. You might call it stop and frisk. That's what you might call it. You might call it actually, you know, search and seizure. You might call it that. You could. I mean, I was told that was racist. I was told that that's because probably she hates black people. That's the only explanation I can think of. She clearly hates minorities. That's why she's doing this. So here was uh, Kathy Hochul announcing this to the consternation of the New York Times. So Hochul announced a five-point plan today, which includes deploying 750 National Guard soldiers and 250 New York State and transit officers to do random bag checks at the city's busiest transit stations, installing new cameras, including ones in conductor cabins, proposing a bill to keep those who assault people off the subway, increasing coordination between district attorneys and police about repeat transit crime offenders and expanding teams who are trained to help those dealing with a mental health crisis on the subway system. Now, there's already pushback to these new changes. Transit advocates say the bag searches are a waste of resources and the NYCLU says black and brown New Yorkers will be targeted. Governor Kathy Hochul says, though, if someone refuses a random bag check, they won't be riding the train. They can refuse. And and we can refuse. We can refuse them. Okay, they can they can walk. Whoa, Kathy Hochul, welcome to the Republican Party. Woo, look at that fascist lady. She's a, she's a white fascist, she is. That's what I heard from the New York Times. We're going to get into more of the insane hypocrisy of the New York governor. Plus, 
San Francisco is no longer a progressive city, according to the San Francisco Chronicle. So it's fun to watch as the consequences of all bad policy come home to roost. We'll get to that momentarily. First, folks, as we just discussed tonight, the Daily Wire backstage, it happened. Matt Walsh, Michael Knowles, Andrew Clavin, Jeremy Boring, and I will be watching and reacting live to the 2024 State of the Union on Daily Wire Plus. We'll be breaking down the State of the Union as it happens. We'll be answering your questions live, including whether there's a defibrillator on hand for the President of the United States. It's an experience you won't find anywhere else. Watch it all live tonight, 8.30 p.m. Eastern on the Daily Wire app and dailywire.com. Okay, meanwhile. So, again, the state of New York is now deploying the National Guard to shut down the crime. Now, you might think that they could have, you know, allowed the police to do that, but no, that's silly. No, no, no. They're going to send state troops down to police over there. And presumably, the members of the New York Times will lose their ever-loving mind over all of this. Beside bag checks, the five initiatives include a $20 million plan to beef up the number of clinical teams responding to people in mental distress on subways from two to 10 system-wide. Wait, hold up. Wait, so there, there's going to be $20 million for 10, for, for 10 teams to respond to system-wide distress? I mean, I may not be an expert at math. How big are those teams? That's a lot of money. My goodness. Another of Hochul's five initiatives is her support of the MTA's plan to install surveillance cameras inside conductor and train operator caps. Surveillance cameras? No, that can't be okay. I mean, what about privacy concerns for people who are peeing in the subway stations? I mean, I, I've been told by the left that all of this is bad. And if Rudy Giuliani were doing any of it, he would be a fascist. Or if Michael Bloomberg were doing any of it, he would be a fascist. But Kathy Hochul is doing it, and we know she's good because she's a Democrat. That's the way this works. All of this is a direct response to the slashing of an MTA conductor named Alton Scott, who narrowly survived a random assault last week when he stuck his head out of his cab as his train stopped at a Brooklyn, Brooklyn subway station. He, so he stuck his head out and someone slashed his neck, which is like New York, man, place where dreams come true. If you can make it there, you literally can make it anywhere because you have to survive. Apparently, Transit Brass declined to comment on Wednesday how many stations might need upgrades to their camera coverage, citing security concerns. They don't even want to say how many places are lacking cameras. They're afraid the criminals are going to go over there. They're also going to hire a new criminal justice advocate to assist the victims of crime in the system and develop a system to flag recidivist offenders to district attorneys, which is like all of them. So I'm pleased to see that reality has finally hit Kathy Hochul. And, um, and again, all credit to Tom Cotton, who's a very bad man because he is a Republican, but all credit to Kathy Hochul. She's obviously just trying to keep the peace. Meanwhile, the city of San Francisco has been hit by reality as well. And it's hilarious. I'm into it. So the San Francisco Chronicle had an actual headline today titled Voters Make It Clear That San Francisco Can No Longer Be Called a Progressive City. Oh, no. Be still my beating heart. What happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. According to Politico, the liberal bastion of San Francisco pivoted rightward in Tuesday's election as voters responded to ongoing drug homelessness and crime crises by approving policies that bolster police and require drug screening for welfare recipients. Wait, did I, did I get elected mayor of San Francisco and I didn't know it? That's weird. These are all the policies I've been recommending for literally decades at this point. The result represents a major victory for embattled Mayor London Breed, a moderate Democrat who faces a tough fight for a second full term in November. She hitched her political future to a slate of three ballot measures that aim to move a city struggling with its slow post-pandemic recovery in a strikingly more conservative direction. So voters approved all three of her measures, including her proposal to screen and mandate addiction treatment for people receiving county welfare. So that's right. She's not going to drug test you before the city cuts you a check, which used to be like baseline Republican policy. And Democrats who wish to win victory are now embracing those policies. So here is the question. Will Joe Biden do the same on a national level? Because it turns out even Democrats don't like living in hell holes like the New York City subway system or the streets of San Francisco. They don't like it at all. London Breed said, quote, we want San Francisco to be exactly what the people who live here want to see. That is a safe, affordable place to call home. Well, all that's going to require is you to stop being a far left crazy person. And it seems as though even the San Francisco voters are beginning to realize that. Besides the drug screening requirement, London Breed proposed expanding police officers' authority to chase suspects and to use drones and video surveillance. She also joined pro-development advocates to back waiving the local tax for developers who convert office buildings into housing. Wait, wait, she's relieving housing regulations and lowering taxes? So she took them directly to voters. Critics attribute her move to the right to desperation amid dismal approval ratings and a growing field of mayoral challengers. They accuse her of trying to turn the city of peace and love into a city catering to the interests of the wealthy. I wasn't aware that poor people loved crime and drug use, but apparently that's something that uh, people in San Francisco think. So congratulations to San Francisco on 
meeting with reality. That's exciting stuff. Now, meanwhile, again, the administration continues to refuse to meet with reality. When it comes to the latest with regard to the Middle East, the United States government continues to promote this idea that a ceasefire is just around the corner if only Hamas will see reason. Spoiler alert, they won't. They're a terrorist group. They seek Palestinian suffering because they think that they will find useful idiots in the West willing to run cover for them to retain power the more suffering they achieve. That's the math here. Israel does not wish to maximize Palestinian suffering. They wish to, ma they wish to maximize Hamas death. They wish to, to depose Hamas in the Gaza Strip and replace that with something that is not a terrorist entity hell-bent on destroying the state of Israel. And Hamas has a different agenda. Hamas's agenda is to get as many Palestinians killed as humanly possible so that the West will then say to Israel to stop. And then Hamas can retain its position in the Gaza Strip and hopefully maximize its position also in the West Bank. That is literally Hamas's agenda. That's why it's so bizarre. The West is like, why won't Hamas sign on to Maybe because their strategic interest dictates they not sign on to a ceasefire. A ceasefire is bad for Hamas because a ceasefire means that the pressure ratchets down on Biden from the West, from the left-wingers. And it ratchets down on Israel from the left-wingers during a ceasefire. And then Israel builds up again, and then they go into Rafah, and they finish this thing off. So Hamas does not want a ceasefire, actually. Hamas wants to retain the hostages so they can use them as leverage. Plus, they're probably continually raping many of them. And many of them are already dead. There are still six American citizens who are being held hostage by Hamas. And yet the Biden administration continues to trot out this bizarre line that somehow Israel has to fight the war nicer. They have to fight the war. Just It has to be a nicer war. There needs to be some way of getting humanitarian aid in there. Well, Israel is shipping in more aid now than they did before October 7th. They're now shipping in something like 300 trucks a day into the Gaza Strip or making available those trucks. No one wants to drive in there. I wonder why. Why wouldn't anyone want to drive into the Gaza Strip? After all, it's filled with nice, decent Palestinian civilians and, and Hamas fellow travelers who will most certainly be kind and gentle to the drivers of the, the trucks or they might kill them and steal the aid. It could be that. So the Biden administration continues to put the pressure on Israel, mainly because they feel that they won't be able to put pressure on Hamas. And so that, of course, gives Hamas every reason in the world to be as intransigent as they want to be. According to the New York Times, talks between Israel and Hamas over the release of dozens of Israeli hostages have stalled, dimming hopes that a deal could be reached before Ramadan begins in a few days. Again, this, this whole timeline, well, we better stop this thing before Ramadan. Wouldn't want any fighting during Ramadan. Well, we can't. It's like Dr. Strangelove. We can't fight in here. This is the war room. Oh, you mean the Islamic holiday of Ramadan? I, I Wow. That radical Muslims consider to be not only extremely holy, but so holy that no one may do anything except for them if they're killing Jews or something. Like that, clearly Ramadan is the, is the dividing line. That, that's where things have to stop dead. Negotiators had been discussing a proposal for an initial six-week ceasefire during which Hamas would release about 40 people, including women, elderly, and ill hostages, and five is female Israeli soldiers, for a substantial number of Palestinian prisoners. The discussions included terms for releasing at least 15 prisoners convicted of serious acts of terrorism who would be exchanged for the female soldiers. The terms also said Israel would release hundreds of other detainees or prisoners, an average of 10 Palestinians for every Israeli civilian freed. These are the terms Hamas turned down. So Hamas was going to get back 400 terrorists for 40 hostages who are innocent. And they turned it down. And they turn it down because they want more Palestinians to die because they think the more pressure they keep on Joe Biden, the more he's going to pressure Israel. It's that simple. American officials had said they hoped to put an agreement in place to release some hostages to do that before Ramadan. But in recent days, Hamas has backed away from the proposed agreement and made demands that Israel refuses to meet. Well, yes, because those demands include things like end the war. Israel's going to leave Hamas in place. No government in Israel, left, right, or center, could, could leave Hamas in place. Meanwhile, the Houthis continue to up the ante. Because as it turns out, the United States desultory attempts to stop the Houthis by hitting a few camels in the ass in the middle of Yemen has been unavailing in stopping this ragtag group of terrorists from firing on ships. According to the Wall Street Journal, three people on board a Barbados flagship died. Clearly, they hate just Jews, right? They hit a Barbados flagship after it was struck in an attack claimed by the Houthis, according to the U.S. military. The bulk carrier True Confidence caught fire after being hit early Wednesday local time by a missile as it sailed 50 nautical miles southwest of Aden, forcing the crew to abandon ship. Three people were killed in the attack. At least four were injured, including three who were in critical condition, according to U.S. CENTCOM. The Iran-backed Houthis say they targeted the vessel because of what the group claimed was its U.S. ownership. There is, in fact, no U.S. ownership. 
There is not owned by the U.S. The ship's managers, 3rd January Maritime of Greece and FML Ship Management of Cyprus, and its owner, True Confidence Shipping of Liberia, was bringing Chinese steel products and trucks to Saudi Arabia and Jordan. And it was mo mostly manned by Filipinos. Other workers on board were from India, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. So that's where we are now. Iranian-backed terrorist groups are killing Asians aboard a, a Greek-flagged ship. And they're doing so in order to hit the Israelis or something. Again, this is the second ship that they've now sunk, a British-registered sh ship that was struck last month by the Houthis sank in the Red Sea in recent days, and that's causing a massive environmental disaster. The environmentalists, of course, are nowhere to be found. So clearly, the pressure needs to be brought on the Israelis or something. That, that I guess, is the, the radical proposition being put forward by the Biden administration. I got to say, they're so disconnected from reality, it's insane. John Kerry is their environmental envoy, the Biden administration. He is leaving his job as environmental envoy, where he did an amazing job not doing anything about the environment. But he did fly around on a lot of jets. And he said many words in a sonorous voice. John Kerry, whose face has grown longer with each passing day, looking more and more like an head from Easter Island. Here he was yesterday talking about the real reason people are angry at the Russians in Ukraine. It's not because they invaded a sovereign country. It's because they're mean to the trees. I believe that uh, Russia has the ability to be able to make enormous changes if it really wanted to. Uh, I mean, if Russia has the ability to wage a war illegally uh, and invade another country, uh, they ought to be able to find the effort to be responsible in the climate issue. We need every country, including Russia. Russia is one of the largest emitters of uh, emitters in the world. If Russia wanted to show good faith, they could go out and announce what their reductions are going to be and make a greater effort to reduce emissions now. And maybe that would open up the door for people to feel better about uh, what Russia is choosing to do. At These people are so stupid. They're so stupid. They're unbelievably stupid. Okay, let me make something clear in foreign policy. M the power of moral suasion means nothing, nothing historically, zero things. Never has a state in human history changed course because people talked mean at it. It has never happened. It will never happen. If you read the history of negotiation, never has moral suasion alone swayed a state from pursuing what it perceives to be its national interest. Russia is not going to, it's a giant gas station. It's not going to suddenly start being nice to the environment because John Kerry calls on the moral voice of the world to show its outrage. Ah, mean letter. Ah. This administration's approach to diplomacy is diplomacy for idiots. They do the same thing with Iran. Well, if we, Joe Biden's like, oh, if we, if we just tell the Iranians we're, we're mad at them, probably... The whole world says they can't do it. The whole world. No, no. You know what? No one cares. No one cares. That's not the way that foreign policy works. Foreign policy has never worked that way. Every attempt in American foreign policy history to change foreign policy by just saying how much we hate what somebody else is doing has been totally useless. And worse than useless, it demonstrates American weakness. But that's John Kerry all over. Thank God that dumb ass was never president of the United States. All right, coming up, we're going to be jumping into more stupidity from people like Rashida Tlaib. Oh, yes, she doesn't say dumb things just about Hamas. She really likes terrorists. But she also has very stupid things to say about the economy. So if you're in the mood for that, head on over and become a member. Use code Shapiro at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.